And Rubenstein, week eight. Week eight yeah, is baby. on us. We're a little bit past the halfway mark in this year college football regular season, 2023. And normally at the top of this show, just to pull back the kimono, normally you tell me what your nickname is going to be for the week. Right. This is how I know you must feel really good about it. You wouldn't tell me. No, because I think in you wouldn't concert, tell me. in concert with the name, um, I just I, I think I'm going to tie it in really nicely, and I, I have an audio situation with it. I'm just I'm very happy about it, Ty. Because look, it's week eight, which means that roughly speaking, most teams have had a buy, so we've got like some five and twos, some six and ones, some seven and O's. Like we've we've got a lot of teams, you know, near the top of the sport, looking very strong, mostly. But I also think it's a fun point of the season in which teams have an opportunity. I think there's an opportunity because in the off season, we'll talk about, oh, this team, you know, they started slow, but they finished winning five straight or they went finished five of six, four of six, four in a row, five out of seven and like finished on a strong note. And I think I'm going to plant my flag right here, Ty, that this is the moment. This right here, week eight is the moment you leave all your love and your longing behind, Ty. You can't carry the entire season with you. If you want to survive, that's right, Ty. The dog days are over. No, no. Welcome to Second Act Saturday. Okay? Second Act Saturday. <laughs> Maybe it's just because I turned 40 this year and yeah. I'm telling myself everybody's got a second act in them. What they do those first few decades maybe doesn't have a bearing on your entire life. So I'm ready. I look at Arkansas. I look at Mississippi State playing each other with an opportunity to perhaps reverse that narrative. Baylor, Cincinnati, Boston College, Georgia Tech, Minnesota, not as much Iowa because they're in the middle of their, their dedicated reverse frosting. Um, I'm looking at Illinois against a, a Tanner Mordecai less Wisconsin having an opportunity. Oklahoma State, they just beat the Kansas schools. Now they get West Virginia. West Virginia, I, I think they can hold their heads pretty high about the first half of their season. Clemson and Miami, both looking to finish strong after some disappointment. This is all relative to expectations. Stanford. All right. Week. All right. How about that? I USC. dig it, man. How about I dig USC? It. It's second USC's act. second act. Second the act for all. Second act for all of us, Dan. Absolutely. Let's just jump right in. Dan, time, help. I need picks of the week. Don't forget to go on out to verballers.com to sign up for our week eight pick'em game, a $100 gift card to Nike.com. Nike, not a sponsor, absolutely could be mm -hmm. on this show. Run the board is the name of the game. So if you go to verballers.com, if you want more information on the game before you go on out to that Patreon page, you can go to playruntheboard.com. Either one will give you all the info you need for how to subscribe to our Patreon and play run the board for that gift card. Uh, look, a few bucks here and there. You can play the rest of the season. You've got fabulous prizes that we gave away at Nintendo Switch uh, like two weeks ago. So never know when those big gifts are going to pop up, but week in, week out, we've been bringing the fire with, I think, the prizes. You, of course, get all sorts of other Patreon bonus perks, ad-free episodes, bonus content, access to the Discord. For Baller Discord goes crazy every Saturday. Uh, perhaps it will again this week on Second Act Saturday, Dan, as we steer uh, directly into the teeth of week eight. Let's start where we always do with our big dogs. <laughs> First big dog, kind of obvious. It is the biggest of all the big dogs in week eight, 12 o'clock on Fox. It is my Penn State Nittany Lions. It is your Ohio State Buckeyes, Ohio State favored by four and a half points at home, Dan Rubenstein. Yes. It's a big game. This is a big game. We've been waiting for this game in the Big Ten. Agree. Um, Plant your flag, Ty. Give the people your headline and then unfurl that banner you're going to fly. There is an aspect to this game that nobody is talking about. Oh. What is it? Or should I say not talking about enough? Okay. A lot of folks that I have seen online, the so-called experts, the mainstream talking heads, <laughs> seem very willing to just gloss. The lamestream media. That's right. Yeah. 
That's right. They're just glossing over a very simple fact that worries me like crazy in this football game. When I checked on Monday, 75% of the bets, 90% of the money was on Penn State. The okay. Betters, the so-called Sharps, also in on Penn State in this football game. The clear selling point, if you are a Penn State better, is the defense. Because per the SP+, Plus, Penn State is what? Like number two defense in the nation, perhaps in the world. Everybody loves Penn State's defense. Yeah. Number one nationally against the pass, which should fare pretty well for them here in this game. They have covered the spread 100% of the time this season. Nearly every stat we have access to is in the green for Penn State. This is a solid team. Yeah. There's one stat that is not. And it is also the stat that worries me the most in a big game scenario. And that is that Penn State has almost no explosion whatsoever. They have no explosion, Dan. Yeah. None. They are 118th in explosive play rate. Pretty much every other similar measure also has them in the deep red. This is not a good team when it comes to creating those big plays. For all the talk about Drew Aller and how maybe he is like the the missing piece for this offense for Mike Yurcich, five and a half air yards per pass, 130th in the nation. They are not stretching the field. And I think that's a problem. Now, I have had some people say to me, well, look who they played. Do you really want to really give it away in any of those games when you know you've got basically a two-game schedule later in the year? Fair. But are we waiting eight weeks? Eight weeks for that long con? Is Mike Yurcich, Danny Ocean playing the long <laughs> con? Just setting everybody up, waiting to lull them in, bring them up close to the box, and then air it deep? Struggle against Northwestern. They'll never know. They'll know. Yeah. I mean, look, if that is the plan, yeah, good on you. Yeah. That takes a lot of patience. I don't think that Penn State is playing any kind of con. I don't think that's who they are. And it worries me that this team is not built to come from behind, which is very much a scenario on the road in Columbus, big game. I could see them finding themselves in a, I don't know, seven to ten point deficit at some point. So yeah. that's where I stand on this game. That is that is the point about this game that bothers me the most. Nothing I said is inaccurate. How do you feel about this game? I think we've got two great defenses, and I think one team has winter wonders at receivers. That team is playing at home, and both teams, I think, have legitimate offensive line concerns, although I think Ohio State's are more pronounced uh, considering the amount of explosion we're used to with Ohio State these past few years, whereas Penn State has had those players just not on the level of Ohio State, has not had a quarterback in terms of arm talent that Drew Aller possesses. But Drew Aller, again, you mentioned it. Like, he's not going downfield. This is not somebody either he doesn't trust himself or the playbook does not trust him. The offensive five and a half. does not trust Five and him. a half yards per, air, air yards per pass. Right, and Penn State fans are quick to defend him. Like, he's taking care of business. He's doing what is asked of him. He's completing passes. He's not turning the ball over. I don't think that's a winning recipe. For as flawed as Ohio State is, I think Kyle McCord will continue to improve, even if the offensive line doesn't. They will continue to get healthier. Uh, you know, Trey Henderson and Amika Abuka, I think, are game time decisions, but they have options in the backfield. They have, you know, Dallin Hayden's coming on. Obviously, we know about Marvin Harrison Jr., Cade Stover, guys like that. And so the problem to me lies in what is it that Penn State can do on offense to win this game? Not just not lose it, not just not throw interceptions, right. but what can they do to threaten Ohio State? And we again, we know Drew Aller's ceiling is probably incredible, but at a certain point, we need results. At a certain point, we need to see it against teams that are not UMass. Uh, so I have Ohio State winning this game by six or seven points. The spread is what, four, four and a half? Four and a half points, yeah. I think Ohio State can cover this spread. Um, I don't love the Buckeyes. I just... At home, if they were on neutral site, if they were in state college, that'd be different for me. But at home with a team that I think is still growing, you know, they're sort of talented from the back in on defense. They, the pass rush is kind of disappointing considering the talent level, but I just don't think Penn State's defense on the road can do it alone. So if you want to say under, if you want to say first half under, that's fine. I, I, I tend to favor Ohio State just because of, and both of these defenses have been great in second halves. 
But at home, Jim Knowles has that reputation for a great second half defense. So I'm going to go with Ohio State to win this game 23 16. I think it's lower scoring as well. I, I think that's a, a good shout. Yeah. Um, I think this is a good football game. Yeah. The full way through. The thing that I keep coming back to, you're 100% right with everything you said about Penn State. Right. And what's the rest over. of the offense? Yeah. I think every, everything about that is correct. I do keep coming back to the fact that, well, Notre Dame could have beaten Ohio State, and that was largely in the back of its defense. And I think Penn State's better than Notre Dame on that side of the ball. Also, Notre Dame could have won that game without having to rely on anything. So, Ohio State on the road. Yeah. Ohio State in the road. Notre Dame could have won that game without having to rely at all on the pass. I mean, eventually what broke Ohio State or what could have broke them was the ground game in the second half for Notre Dame, which did start to come alive. And I think that is essentially what this version of Penn State wants to be. They want to try and pound it on the ground until eventually they have a hole open up for Nick Singleton, who I've said before is a home run hitter. Katron Allen, likewise. I think Penn State can win this game even without having to stretch the field, which is why I like them plus four and a half and outright 24-20. You like Penn State to win this game because they don't need to be explosive to win this game. That's correct. That's correct. I think they can play the style of football that they've been playing all year and they can still win. I'm okay. not crazy about it. I would love to see more down the field, but I think they're good enough to win on the merits of that alone. Now, here's my question for you. If you were to poll Penn State fans in June of any given year, and you'd say, how do you feel about James Franklin? And let's be more specific. How do you feel about James Franklin preparing this team to win big games against the two teams that Penn State annually measures it itself against? What do you think the, the straw poll would indicate from Penn State fans? I think if, if you were to ask them... Because Ohio State fans summer. might have the same response about Ryan Day. That's exactly June. right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Everybody is skeptical of their head coach in June. Yeah, I have sensed an almost unfettered bit of excitement about this game in the Penn State community. Okay. Fellow Penn Staters, and for people who are listening for the first time and wondering what is his deal, I'm a Penn Stater. And now Penn State is my alpha team because Notre Dame. Because <laughs> Notre Dame left you. I have that. I have that position flexibility. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there is a lot of optimism about this team and about this game because it does not feel like Ohio State is amped up to a thousand the way they normally are. Okay. And so there's a sense that Penn State's defense can hold down this offense and that they're good enough on offense in their own right to score points against a good defense, like they did, like they did against Iowa. Frankly. Different game, different circumstance, but I'm on Penn State. I'm going to... On the road, because they haven't done do much it. on the road this year, right? They look sluggish against Northwestern for a half and then slowly That's overwhelmed right. the Northwestern offensive line. But both West Virginia and Iowa were in State College, yes? Correct. You're almost religious in this, that you are just, you're putting a lot of faith. I am. You are well, saying, you know, maybe there's not evidence, but I believe in the higher power of Penn State's offensive line magically getting it together in Columbus. One of the things that I got right this season was Texas outright on the road at Tusca in Tuscaloosa against Alabama. Yeah. And I'm going to hang my hat on that because at least I got one big one right. Yeah, I was going to say, USC one. outright big over Notre Dame last huge, year. Huge, huge. Didn't work. Yeah. Um, Didn't work. By the okay. way, yeah, I have perhaps the greatest, a uh, bit of a tease here. Yeah. The greatest fantasy thing ever conceived about this game that I'm going to come back to later in the episode. Yeah. It's the best wait. one we've ever had. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, all right. Yeah, I'm going Ohio State. I have a lot of still, I have a lot of concern about the Buckeyes and high leverage situations in the red zone, uh, sluggish first half, like all of the things that have plagued Ohio State in big games uh, these past couple of seasons, I think also ring true here. And if you remember, this game was uh, a really good game just after the, crazy interceptions that began it last year in state college. And if Penn state doesn't, you know, set themselves back early, this should be a fun back and forth. It should be tight. It should be a lot of fourth and two. Will he, won't he from his own 48 kind of moments. I just, I still think I'm going with the team that can have a back breaking three to five plays in a moment like this. So we disagree. Go to our next big dog. <laughs> 3.30 CBS, it is Tennessee on the road at Alabama. Alabama, a home favorite of nine points. Interesting thing that I found in looking over stat profiles. Of course, we've been watching all of these teams' games for the duration of the season. Most of us have at this point. What most people don't know about this matchup is how similar these teams are on paper. 
if you did a blind comparison, blind comparison of Joe Milton and Jalen Milrow of the offense of the defense of the profiles of pretty much all sides of this, I don't think you'd know the difference. I don't think most people would know the difference. Okay. I don't think they would recognize one from another because they are very similar in that respect. Um, that's interesting for this matchup. That's that's more interesting, I think, as an explainer, perhaps for the SEC and where the SEC is at in 2023. Just there seems to be some level of parity that uh, we haven't seen recently. Okay. We can debate whether that's better or worse than in previous years, whether that makes for a more interesting Saturday watching experience. But I like I, the novelty, it, I'd say. But yeah. it is different. Yeah. You know, I don't know if it's better or worse, but it is different. So the story time for me is this. The story time for me is last Saturday, about midway through the first half. I tweeted, this is when Bama was starting to run away with it against Arkansas. I tweeted out that Zombie Alabama. Roll time. Right? <laughs> did nothing in the second half, yeah. Talked about, hey guys, Zombie Alabama's back. And I was really proud of myself because I said time of undeath. Get it? Time of... No, I'm, I'm with you. Time of undeath, first half, week seven, whatever last week was. Mm -hmm. Then Arkansas came back. Yeah. Well, Arkansas Alabama came nothing back. in the second half, yeah. Right. Arkansas came back. Bama was sort of hanging on for the win. Their offense went into a shell. And looking back on that, when I was doing the prep for this week, sort of dawned on me, like, between the missed bets last week, and the little stuff like this, I may actually have real jinxing powers. <laughs> yeah, of course. It may, it may actually, like people think I'm doing it just to sort of play a bit and a character and all that. I may actually have this within me. And so my question to you is, who do you want to win this game? Who want do people, to? Who do people listening want to win this game? Because if this is truly something that I have unharnessed deep within me in my marrow, I'm a content producer, man. I need to monetize. Yeah. I need to monetize this in a way that I have not previously. Yeah. So I'll turn it over to you. You tell me what you want to happen. And then I'm just going to go the other way. Cause I oh. honestly, I looked at this game up and down. My initial gut was nine points is too many because Tennessee's got a good defense and Bama scores like 26 points at most against good defenses. Yeah. Nine points in a low scoring game feels like you would want to take Tennessee there. That was my initial read on it, but I, I'll defer to you here, and you can tell me what you think, what you want to happen. And I'm just going to go the other way, see if it yeah. works again. Okay, so the the connective tissue right now is you're right that both of these teams sort of behave similarly at times, and they both won ugly against Texas A&M recently, Alabama a couple of weeks ago, last week, Tennessee, both Max Johnson iterations of Texas A&M. I'm going to take Tennessee here because I think there is something, and I, I don't love taking Tennessee on the road. But I think I would take Joe Milton's ceiling over Jalen Milrow's recent ceiling, where he doesn't seem to be running in the same way. And he needs two big plays to win a game rather than 11 pretty good plays. Like, I don't know if he has 11 pretty good plays in him anymore. Where I, I, whereas I think Tennessee's rushing attack, Tennessee's defense, Tennessee's stability, which is a very strange thing to say for a team that lost at Florida this year, um, and a, just a Tennessee program that has been anything but stable. I think Alabama's kind of in a button breaker situation. I think their tummy's expanding more and more. A you know, it starts button breaker. A button breaker, Ty. I'm just I'm just coming up with terms here. I'm just just, just out making of the it ether up. right now. Okay. I like it. A button breaker, right there. Yeah. They're getting bigger. They're swelling a little bit week to week. It's close against Ole Miss late. It's close against Texas AM late. It's close against USF late. It's close oh. against Arkansas. At a certain point, the expanding, not luck but the expanding trials and tribulations are going to come to a head and that button's going to pop off that pants, holding in all of that pressure Ty. Yeah. And I think it's Tennessee this week. I think it's kind of ugly, but I think Tennessee has the ends. I think Tennessee has the defense to get to Jalen Milrow. I think the pass defense will be good enough to perhaps force those kind of consistent couple mistakes from Jalen Milrow. And I think Tennessee wins this on the road and at 21 17 is somewhere i just don't see where the line makes sense and i i really do feel that way that like you can only get away with what alabama has been putting forth in these second halves for so long 
And I think Tennessee has the actual roster on both sides of the ball, even with the pass, the, the passing game not there on offense. It's very much a different looking Tennessee this season, but I'm still going with Tennessee here to pull the upset on the road in Tuscaloosa because of, I don't know if they're stable, but they're more stable, which is very strange to say. Well, look, you, you know where I stand on this. You know where my gut is yeah. on this game. And even before the season, I said Tennessee's going to beat Alabama. I said they're going to beat them outright. I know. But we're going to test this out. We got to test this out. Not so fast, my friend. My friend. <laughs> Fran? 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 Yeah. Alabama, when you weren't paying attention, switched it up to an elastic waistband this week, Dan. <laughs> okay. Alabama yeah. wins and covers at home. There's my pick. It's my official Cover. pick. Let's see what happens. Okay. Let's see what happens. You're leaning into the surest thing in college football picking strategy. Okay. The opposite, a George Costanza opposite approach. We'll see if it works. Okay. Fair enough. But I share, I share your skepticism. Again, the most Alabama has scored against a top 75 defense was 26 points. And that was two Here, weeks ago against AM. Can I give you the most concerning thing about Alabama? And it, it's not the close games per se. The concerning thing is Alabama has a better roster than everybody they will play this year in the regular season, including Texas. They just they have a better roster. And just in, in, in terms of the, the recruiting game, in terms of the transfers that have come in, and I know the quarterback issue is definitely an issue. Superior rosters should get better over the course of a game. Sure, you might be able to, you know, an RPO breaks the right way and you score a quick seven or even 14 like South Carolina did against Georgia. Super accurate early. The better, deeper roster should get better over the course of a game. Eventually, fresher legs, fresher talent, whatever, is going to separate. And yes, we have upsets. We have all of that. But Alabama, against some of these teams that, and look, AM's defense has a comparable roster, but like Alabama's not getting better over the course of games. They're getting worse over the course of games. And so that to me is almost a mental thing that this team is not locked in for four straight quarters. They don't they don't seem to have the killer instinct in the way that they used to. No. That you know. there's that confidence in just stay the course, things are going to go well, you know? And there is no course for Alabama this year. They're winning, winning is a skill, but I don't think you can just say, "Yeah, Alabama almost double digit favorite. Let's do it." I'm La not there. No, I'm with you. And uh, that's why I'm going Alabama, of course. Yeah, obviously, obviously. Last week, though, was, I think, case in point. Last week, they had an opportunity to drill a reeling Arkansas team, a 2-5 and five Arkansas team that's probably going to fire its coach at the end of the year. I don't know, probably, but they have one of the worst offensive lines in the country. It's right bad, now. it's yeah. bad, and he's an offensive line guy. But this is an Arkansas team that was reeling. Four straight losses, starting with BYU, and, of course, now recently uh, lost the Bama game a week ago. They could have drilled them. They could put uh, an Alabama team from two years ago puts 50 on that Arkansas team. Yeah. And they went into a shell in the second half and they did nothing. That tells you everything you need to know. So yeah. uh, you have seriously Tennessee plus the nine. I've got Bama semi seriously just kind of testing things. Out. I have Tennessee outright, by the way. I just don't think oh, you're do. going to lose close in a rock fight. 21 17 Tennessee. Yeah. Oh, man. My man. All right. Final big dog. <laughs> 8 p.m. on the Fox Network. It is Utah. It is USC. Utah has won the last three of these matchups, and two of the three were by wide margins. They won 47-24 in the Pac-12 game last December. That yeah, was their Caleb long... Williams hamstring. Yeah, yeah. Caleb Williams hamstring, but they're but Utah's largest margin of victory ever in this series. And there is a pretty big part of me that wonders if Utah just has USC's number. Because I think our conversation is going to shift to well, what is us? What is U, Utah's? Excuse me. Mm -hmm. What is Utah's offense? What is it supposed to be? And we can make the Andy Ludwig jokes, but I just I wonder if if it even matters in this game. If if Utah just has the formula for beating USC, I ultimately the reason I'm going to go USC is because I there's a bigger part of me that wonders if Utah just has the dudes at all for this. You know, like. Maybe they've got the formula, but they are getting literally nothing at quarterback. And on a well, per, on a per play basis, they've also been pretty bad on the ground. So if they're winning, they're winning because of aggressive defense. They're winning because the defense forces turnovers. They're winning because basically they do three things right. They do three things right on defense. They force three and outs 47% of the time. 
They win the field position battles, a little bit of Iowa there. Yeah. And they force those turnovers. Like I said, they're plus seven in turnover margin. Those are the three things that this defense does really well. And it has been more than enough in their game so far this season to win um, in most cases. But in yeah, a game I, like this where you got to, I think you got to score some points against USC and Caleb Williams. I don't know. That troubles me. Okay. So if you look at USC's schedule, the the good things that they did, I think, came in those first like four and a half games. So then the second half of the Colorado game happened. And then the Arizona game happened, triple overtime Arizona, where they could just run straight at USC and USC couldn't get off the field. You mentioned the turnovers. You mentioned the yeah. forcing three and outs. Certainly didn't happen against Notre Dame. I think Utah wins this game, and they, they might even win this game by 10 to 13 points. Utah? Yes. Wow. Here's, okay, so the Utah passing stats. We talked yesterday. Of, we talked yeah. two days ago. Yeah. And you were like, yeah, I, think, I just think USC is better. What changed? I sat, I sat in my meditation chamber this morning. Okay. My West Coast Pac-12 meditation chamber. Okay. And I just thought about this. Okay. Who would you, if you were a fan of one of these teams, or, or which fan, which team would you want to be a fan of going into this game? Would you Do you want to be a USC fan after that Notre Dame loss, after eking by? It might be a button, like maybe last week was a button breaker, and this one <laughs> is a, a suspender breaker. I don't know, something for USC against Utah. Bryson Barnes can throw the ball a little. He's not great. And some of the stats are Nate Johnson throwing. Some of them are Bryson Barnes. USC's defense is kind of friendly. Okay? Yes. And Utah has played some quality teams. They lose the game to, I think it was Oregon State on the road, 21-7. to Oregon State is, I think, a more complete team, even though they're not as talented on defense. I think they're locked in and focused better on defense. And... I just I would much rather root for Utah's defense in this game than USC's offense. I think the results are there. I think it'll travel. I think USC reeling after that Notre Dame game, where now everybody's kind of piling on USC, was like, where's the offensive line? Caleb Williams is trying to do everything himself. The the defensive line is not there. And we saw a Utah team get creative last week. I don't know if they're going to score as many. You know, I think they had 38 points against Cal as they were running a lot of like double halfback, one of whom is a part-time safety in Sione Vaki. Like, <laughs> I think Utah and their pass rush will overwhelm USC, give themselves av advantageous situations, and just do more of what Notre Dame did. And that was have defensive backs who can run with USC's wide receivers who have been somewhat disappointing this year and beat up this year. I just don't know what USC is doing to move the ball if they're going to depend on Caleb Williams doing that kind of thing against Utah. Yeah. With less talent than he had last year everywhere else on that offense. So I think Utah absolutely can methodically win this game, keep USC's offense off the field by converting a bunch of third and twos. And I don't think the juice is going to be there in the Coliseum after last week. Do you? I mean, people will still be excited. It's a big game, Dan. It's a big game. But I think the, with the manner in which USC lost last week, I think took a lot of wind out of the yeah. Trojan sails. Well, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to go USC because I think USC is a better team. I would never, ever bet this game with real money. Never, because I think it will probably be right on that number. I think the seven point spreads about right. I think it's something like 28, 21 USC. Mm -hmm. I think the risk for Utah for as good Utah's as the out, not down another tight end. Like they don't have a lot. Offense. They have nothing. They don't have dudes. Pass catchers. Yeah, they don't, they don't have dudes on offense. They don't. But the defense is good. The defense will keep this game close. It's not going to be a runaway train by any stretch. The risk for them on defense, though, is the big plays because they blitz a lot. Mm, I know. They're also giving up a lot of big plays and specifically through the air, which is Caleb Williams music. That's what that's what he wants to live on. And that's how he wants to beat you by making those big plays. So you blitz him. He scrambles around. He drives you crazy. Find somebody open down the field who runs for a million yards. That could very much be the formula for USC to win this game. Now, Utah beat them twice last year. Mm -hmm. And again, maybe Cam I'm just in, Utah. Yeah. Cam Rising Utah, different team. Maybe I'm just in my own head with this. But um, I am going to go USC outright. If we, live USC, in a universe, if we live in a universe, and sorry to cut you off, but if Cam Rising plays, does that change your tune? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so, because I don't know what, what status we will find him in if he's out there for what it's worth. If you Google cam rising injury status, 
you're going to start seeing articles about, hey, maybe a medical red shirt in the seventh year makes sense. Yeah, yeah. For rising I saw that at this point, which is never a great sign if you want to get him back for what it's worth. Both both he and Grant, Brant Keithy want to get back as soon as they can and play. They're not looking for a medical red shirt, but Cam Rising's going to have his full dental degree. But <laughs> I'm he's done. It's going to be Cam Rising. He can operate TDS. on himself by the time he gets out of there. Correct. Um, OK, so that doesn't change things for you. You believe in USC. I just think. USC doesn't really emphatically beat or maybe even beat a team with its act together. And I think Arizona has its act together, but that was still a backup quarterback in the way. Obviously, Utah has a backup quarterback and Arizona probably should have won that game. Yeah, so I agree. I, agree I don't think USC is built to beat a team with its act together. And I think Utah kind of does, weirdly enough. Before we get to our next segment, um, shout out Tim Buckley, the voice of all things weather in the great Ooh. state of North Carolina, fellow Penn Stater. I believe we'll be at the Penn State Ohio State game. Don't know if he can provide us provide us with real time weather updates. Don't think we really need that. But no. uh, here is what the weekend looks like with respect to weather. Have a listen, guys. It is mid October. You know what that means? Real football weather has arrived. That's mm -hmm. right. Big Ten West style fifties and sixties for kickoffs in Iowa, Illinois, and Nebraska. Find your perfect hoodie. South Florida, crazy comfortable. This is weird. It's in the seventies for Clemson and Miami. Good stuff there. But Texas toast. Oh boy. Houston in the nineties hosting the Longhorns. West coast looking good. Rockies too, but in the Northeast, our region of concern. Oh yeah. Cloud showers again. Bad news for the Patriot league guys. Penn State, Ohio state clouds chill couple showers possible we'll see how that affects the game thanks again shout out tim for doing that he dialed in and left that message on the reverb line which we right. hope you will use 855 verbal three we have switched up our saturday evening slash sunday morning recording a little bit this year and we are asking for you to call 855 verbal three with your roasts yes it will be included in the week eight campfire give us a good old-fashioned roast that we can mix together. Not, and play us. As not us. Do not roast us. No, don't roast us. Even tender. Is that what I said? <laughs> well, yeah. Give us a roast. No, no, no. So, don't roast us. Roast. I can't handle it. Unless Dan is wrong. You can roast Dan, That's but I don't need any more roasts for bad picks because I am unshaven. I didn't shower today. I'm wearing the hat as we record this. This has really been weighing on me that I can't pick a damn game right. So I'm just going to steer into it. And again, perhaps monetize if that's what. Sure. If that's roast. what the future holds for me, I will do that. Roast drive charts, roast uh, coaches, roast games, roast moments, anything you want. Or time. Let's, let's get to our next segment. Think about the heart, the passion, the love, the commitment, and the energy you're willing to put into it. What am I listening to? Uh, that sound is from a motivational video out on YouTube from a gentleman named Thomas Platts. Actually, I don't think it's from him. It's from fans of his. Okay. You know who that is? I don't. Thomas Platts is the so-called quad father. Oh. He had 30-inch quads when he was at his in his prime back in the 70s. <laughs> okay. Nice. Okay. So let's be clear what this is, because there were some questions after last week's episode. Mm -hmm. Some, let's say, unnamed streaming platforms, which are not a sponsor, but absolutely could be, probably would not want probably to won't be. be. Yeah. They allow you to set up a quad box mm -hmm. when you're watching games on Saturdays. You can watch four games at once on your TV. Mm -hmm. You just get four rectangles. Give you some them. options. Yeah, Four at once. We are asking you humbly as Solid Verbal listeners, allow us to be your week eight quad fathers. Build the quads. We are going to build our respective quads, the games yeah. that we would watch in those four boxes mm -hmm. if we could put together our dream quad box scenario right here in squat tober is that what you squat tober <laughs> that's right that's right, okay. that's right. <laughs> you're welcome everybody i say what you will about any other college football show squat tober we're going to activate the most robust glutes in america here in that's squat tober right. i hope somebody's squatting while listening to this and their <laughs> jaw just dropped this is how we get fowler to call in again that's true. We had him on before. This is how we get him to call the reverb line because you play That's sounds cool. like that to intro a segment. Mm -hmm. Fowler's in. That's how we get Fowler back. Oh, man. Welcome to Squat Tober. Do you squat, Ty? <laughs> no. Should you be? I podcast. I should be. I did some squats this morning, Ty. I'm ready. 
Let's I talk mean, about your dream quad box, Quad Father Dan. Yeah. In this here quad early, father. Er, early, early. Win. I got more sounds. You want this now one? My question to you is how bad do you really want legs? How bad do you want those legs? Dan? I need these legs, Ty. What is your dream quad box? Give I go to the legs. beach in the summer. I don't want chicken legs here. I play some tennis. I need. How bad need do you want legs. those legs? Tell me. Pretty badly, Ty. Okay. Uh, my early my early window quad is of course going to feature Penn State Ohio State. That one doesn't count though. We already talked about oh, that. Oh, okay. That doesn't games. count. No. Okay. So in quadrant one, I'm going UCF Oklahoma. I'm going to give those points. Oklahoma minus nineteen and a half. Okay. Okay. Uh, Oklahoma coming off of a bye week. John Reese Plumley. John Rice Plumley. Excuse me. Coming back for for the Knights, but I still don't like this defense at all. And I don't really like him throwing into this Oklahoma defense that's been quite opportunistic. So I'm going to give those points there. I think Oklahoma can win by three touchdowns plus. That's quadrant one, Ty. I'm still laughing at Squattober. Squattober. <laughs> it's Squattoberfest. You have, do you have dumbbells? You can just do like the handheld squats. It's not true squats. Dude, I'm a podcaster. You can do some air squats, Ty. That's no problem. I can squat my body weight. Yeah, continue. Keep going. All right. Uh, Quad number two, I have Boston College, Georgia Tech. Oh. I, want, I want one of these teams to win games, plural. And you, it's want this, you want to watch this game? Okay, so I've enjoyed watching Jamal Haynes. I've enjoyed watching Haynes King. And maybe that's just because he rolled out and nailed a 93-yard pass <laughs> on the run to beat Miami. I grant you, that's possible. Yeah, I I would like for Georgia Tech to throw some some fun into the ACC to, you are to throw a around sick their way. You are sick. Continue. Okay. Those are your two. Give yeah. me two more and then I'll give you mine. Uh, Rutgers with a really nice back half of the schedule. I'm going to give those points. By the way, in terms of the, the Boston College Georgia Tech game, I am giving those five points. I think Georgia Tech will win by 10 to 13 points. Uh, I have Rutgers. This is kind of a big road week for me, by the way. I have the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers going to Indiana, one of the most embarrassing offenses, if not the most embarrassing offense. But I have New Jersey ties. I love New Jersey food. I have Rutgers friends. Um, so shout out Piscataway. I'm going Rutgers here in another one of my quads. So that's three quads right now. You got one more. One Oklahoma, more Oklahoma, Rutgers, Georgia Tech. And for the fourth quadrant, I'm going a rerun of Parks and Rec because I can't justify any of these other matchups. Um, no, if I if I were forced into it, uh, I would probably go Air Force Navy, just because it's such a specific matchup. Go. I don't love Navy this year, but Air Force has been a fun story, and I'm rooting for them to go undefeated. I think that would be cool to see a service academy run the table. So on the road, I think it's tough. And I actually like searched pretty diligently to figure out a way in which Navy could win that game. But I, you know, I don't love Air Force's schedule thus far, and the performance against the schedule hasn't always been great. But I just I don't like the Navy defense first year coach. So I'm going with Air Force to win this game by 14 to 20. I, I'm going to go Air Force um, to win, but Navy to cover because Air Force okay. flying across country. They're the Air Force, though. That's they're what the they Air do. Force. This was a close game last year. Air Force traveling west to east also without their quarterback who hurt his knee against Wyoming. Yeah. So I'll go Navy plus the points. My my quad is you mentioned UCF, Oklahoma. I'm Oklahoma minus anything. A big part of the talking point here on the show, at least for me, was, hey, UCF's pretty good. Well, then you look at UCF and it's like, mm, they beat Kent State, Boise, and Villanova. Are they, though? Are they really? Are they really good? And gave away some, some something fierce against Baylor. Oh, yeah. they yacked the Baylor game away. The two games against Kansas schools were not close. Got absolutely destroyed against Kansas. Maybe the bye came at the right time. They're off a buy coming into this game, but I'm inclined to go with my gut and go Oklahoma minus whatever. Second game in the quad box for me, Mississippi State at Arkansas. Oof, uh, do it. Arkansas is favored by six and a half. They've lost five straight. Brutal stretch. We talked about it earlier. Brutal stretch. The path to six wins for the Hogs has narrowed considerably, but four of those five games against Power 5 opponents have been one score affairs. So yeah. You get the entertainment factor there. Right. Yeah. You're guaranteed at least some some sort of entertainment factor here if that's something you're into. Mississippi State off a bye. I'd probably take the points here. I think it'll be close. I think it'll be an interesting matchup. Um, I am also going to go Rutgers at Indiana. You don't want to watch this game, but I do. <laughs> um, 
and I'm not talking to you because you've got it in your quad. I'm talking about people out there. We'll watch it for you and kind of report back. Rutgers can get bowl eligible in week eight. The okay. kicker, though, is that they kind of have to do it this week because after the bye week, they finish out against Ohio State, Iowa, Penn State, and Maryland. So give me Rutgers minus the five on the road at Indiana. Final game in the quad for me is Baylor at Cincinnati. Okay. Since he favored by three and a half. I looked at the projections earlier. Baylor's got a 10% chance of making a bowl game, which is not good. The offensive line has been a nightmare, which has basically nuked the entire offense. Statistically, the defense is actually worse. It's worse. So then you ask, why do you want to watch this game, Ty? I want to watch it because I don't understand Baylor. I don't know what the hell's okay. going on. I look at the numbers. I watch the games. I I want to know where it all went wrong in a hurry because I felt like this was a team that was headed in a much different direction. This game to me, it's like one of those, remember the magic eye books where you had to like cross your eyes to see the sailboat? That That's where I'm at with Baylor. So I want to see how they hold up against Cincinnati, which I think could be the worst team in the Big 12. So Wait, you Baylor, think Cincy could be the worst team in the Big could 12? Be. They could be the worst team in the Big 12. Yeah, it's either them or Houston. You think Baylor is better? I think Cincinnati could be. Could be the worst team. Oh, I don't know, man. Baylor does so many things poorly. Now, some of that is what? Sawyer Robertson, Baylor, and I'm not blaming it on him per se, but it's just more difficult with a Look, backup quarterback. So, yeah. great. Let's see what happens. That's why I want to watch. Baylor you, plus three and a half. a very Lurleen Lumpkin moment from you. Why is it your wife doesn't, doesn't understand you, but I do. You That's don't right. want to watch this game, but I do. Um... I don't know where Lurleen Lumpkin came from, but it's in it's let's in, go. Yeah, it's in the brain somewhere. Okay. Um I have Cincinnati there, by the way. Okay. Yeah. Let's go uh, afternoon slate. Welcome to the pain zone is where we live. <laughs> Welcome to Squatober. That's where we live. Here's my here's my quad. Can I ask you a question on Squatober it... really quickly? Oh, okay. If you hammered the squatting the rest of the yeah. for, a, for a month straight with right. solid wife Kate notice. No. Like physically, see, like, do we want to try this? Do we want to do this? Absolutely. I mean, Squat-tober you're gonna have fest. to walk around in like borderline skimpy clothes. Sure, she would notice that, but I don't think she'd notice <laughs> increased volume in the quad area. No, not just quad. Squats affect everything. I well, I get that. Okay, Squattober. We'll work out a plan after this. Okay, make your own plan accordingly if you're listening to the show. Yeah, Squattober fest. <laughs> they have giant asses now. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> okay, continue. here's my quad. 3.30 ABC, I've got the Washington State-Oregon game. Oregon minus 19 and a half. There were a lot of fun early vibes on Wazoo, and then they got murdered a week ago against Arizona. And uh, that was a week after the loss against UCLA. Now they're back on the road against Oregon, a team that clearly could have beaten Washington. We talked about that one ad nauseum. I think Oregon kicks the crap out of them. Okay. So I'll take Oregon minus whatever. That's That's... Quad A. Quad B for me is South Carolina at Missouri. Missouri favored by seven. Shane Beamer, I'm sure you saw, was so mad that he kicked something and broke his foot after the loss to Florida a week ago. Uh, I am on the points, though, for South okay. Carolina. South Carolina plus the number because I think this is a real getaway game, a look-ahead spot for Mizzou because they go into a bye next week, and then after the bye, they come back in week 10 against Georgia. This is Georgia without Brock Bowers. Surely Missouri players have seen this. Surely Eli Drinkwitz is going to convince them they can beat Georgia. And I think that is all to say they're not going to give a lick about South Carolina. Lowly two and four South Carolina. South Carolina has plenty of defense, but they can score. They've got a top yeah. 20 offense. So I think Mizzou probably wins at home, but I think this is a fun game where I like South Carolina to cover. Uh, the other two for me, the Floyd of Rosedale game. I'm going to come back to this when I give you my bet at the end. But um, Iowa minus three and a half at home against Minnesota. The over-under is 32 and a half points. Only 11 times since 2005 has there been a point spread less than 35. Mm. Iowa has played in seven of those games, <laughs> which is nuts. But they have. One of them was last season. In this game, it was a 13 to 10 game. They clearly hit the under 31 and a half in that one. I'm, I'm considering and probably will just bet the under everything, but I'm inclined to take points here because in a game that low scoring, which we know it's going to be, I'll just take points. 
I like Iowa. I'm just going to take the points, though. Wow. Final one for me at 3.30 is Oklahoma State at West Virginia. West Virginia favored at home by three and a half points. I am interested in this game because it came out last week and said Oklahoma State figured itself out, and the Pokes won the game against Kansas. That's the only bet I got right last week. <laughs> so now I'm hitching my wagon to the Cowboys, baby. I'm saying the offense is getting better. They have shown improvement. I'm saying that the defense has more than enough to contain a West Virginia attack that I think is still fairly one-sided. They're better. West Virginia is better. Right. But I believe that this Pokes defense has stabilized after two brutal weeks that we saw against South Alabama and Iowa State earlier in the year. And I like Oklahoma State outright. It's a pretty good quad. quad. That's my quad. Quads right there. Okay. I'm going, obviously, Oregon, and I like them giving the points as well because Dan Lanning has suffered some embarrassing losses. But if you remember, after losing to Washington last year, they bounced back and beat Utah with Bo Nix on like a leg. Uh, if you remember, they bounced back and demolished BYU after getting demolished themselves by Georgia. So I think this is a team that will be locked in. I don't think this is a team licking its wounds. And I think Washington State specifically is built in the way that Oregon would love for them to be built, which is to say kind of a thin defense. The offensive line has been struggling going against an Oregon pass rush. What we saw what they did to Michael Penix in the second half. I think they're going to eat. I think they're going to be points off of turnovers. I think it's going to be over quickly against Washington State. And, you know, they had they needed 22 points in the last three minutes to win this game last year, if you remember. That's right. But I think it's going right. to there's going to be a different rhythm to this game in, in Autzen. So, obviously, I have Oregon in Quadrant 1. I have South Carolina. I have South Carolina covering, like you do, against Mizzou. Yeah. Uh, you like that situation? Seems like a good situation. Here's what I like. I like that they... I, they have an argument that the best receiver in this game is not Luther Burden because Xavier Leggett is incredible. He's really good. Yeah. He run like he is a long strider. He's a big body and he's a great target for uh for Spencer Rattler. They're not built to win a lot of tough games on the road, which I think this will be, but this definitely has the feel of a game that ends weirdly. And so I have them covering in this game, maybe winning, but at least covering. Because I, I still think there's some juice to South Carolina, despite some of the results. I have Toledo, Miami of Ohio on the road. I have Toledo winning this game outright as a one point favorite. This is the clash in the MAC this year. Two good quarterbacks in Daquan Finn and Brett Gabbert. I like this game a lot. I like that this game is happening. I like the uniform matchup. I like Toledo great, here to win. Great because, uniform matchup, yeah. Yes. They, they're a more complete team. I think their defense will travel, but I love that we have this head, headline matchup uh, in this afternoon window. It would have been actually cool if it were like a Wednesday night match where everybody was watching it, uh, but nonetheless, that's in a quad for me. And then I have Oklahoma State, West Virginia, agreeing with you uh, in that it's going to be part of my quad but I have West Virginia winning this game. I think Oklahoma State, I think their turnaround maybe isn't because of their defense as much as their offensive line seems to be protecting Alan Bowman a little bit better, and they've been a little bit more creative on offense. I went back and watched the the Kansas game in its entirety. They did some fun things. So I'm going with West Virginia just because I think that defense at home, in that environment, I think they're going to be able to get it done. They're healthier on offense. So I'm going with West Virginia, and Oklahoma State has been at least a nice, you know, Late September, early October turnaround story. I'll take Toledo minus the points. I'll take Houston plus the points in the Texas game. Mm, I don't have that. I'll take I'll take Houston plus the points there. Um, and I'm also going to take Pitt on the road over Wake. Wake's favored by a point, point and a half, somewhere in that neighborhood. Right. I think Wake. I think Wake is really bad. I think Wake I mean, is really bad. And I have Pitt's not great, but I think they're better than Wake. I have Iowa covering at home because. You have to you have to at least like something about Minnesota to to make that case. Um, but I, I still think Iowa's defense is going to score enough to cover that. Uh, I have Texas covering on the road against Houston in a letdown spot for Houston. Obviously, everybody gets up for Texas, but um, they they went on a hail mary last week against West Virginia. I just you know it's going to be tough to match yeah. that energy. I have Wisconsin even without Tanner Mordecai winning at Illinois. Uh, Northwestern covering against Nebraska because the thought of Nebraska's Offense giving 14 points just doesn't exist in the universe that is my brain. Um, I wow. actually North Texas has had a really good offense this year. They've been quietly like a really fun offense. Uh, the opposite is true of their defense. So I was gonna say they've loudly offense. been a very bad defense. They've loudly also been a very bad defense, but it's year one. So I'm I'm going to lane here, but I had my eye on that as a reason okay. to, to take a dog on the road. All right, uh, final quad opportunity. You have 
to achieve failure. You have to take it that far. Nobody wants to go that far. It's too scary. But you know something? I got news for you. That's where winning is. That's where the winning is, Dan. Oh, my God. We're just going to have such, like, it's going to be a Thanksgiving talking point. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. Is Ty walking with, like, a, a different cadence? Is there something happening, right? Is what is going on? Why did he have to cut a slit in his jeans? Is there a reason for that? Yeah, you're going to be going to a big and tall store just to <laughs> fit in. What do you have in terms of extended seats? Yeah. <laughs> I love this. Oh, no. Final quad opportunity. Yeah. Um, we both have Clemson at Miami, right? Uh, I have Clemson at Miami, yes. Miami yeah. doesn't win at home. Clemson <laughs> has the second act Saturday opportunity here. That, uh... By the way, I didn't realize, I mean, in watching Clemson games, you see it, but quad one Clemson, Miami, how, how much there is a, a lack of explosion to Clemson's offense down the field. Oh, it's bad. It's really when, like, bad. That was, it's sort of a Sam Pittman situation. Where, like got to have the offensive line. The good Dabo doesn't have receivers year over year over year making plays downfield. And that was the whole thing. That was the whole thing. That was the whole bit. For yeah. Clemson. And so. I still have Clemson winning this game because of their defense and because TVD is like, there's a weird thing where a bunch of people are like, he's injured. And Mario Cristobal is like, hey, he's ready to roll. I'm like, hmm, I don't know who I'm trusted in that situation. Yeah, I don't know so. if there's some gamesmanship going on there, but the the line moved. The line moved right. almost instantly because there were reports uh, that TVD was seen walking around campus with an ace bandage all the way up above his knee. Yeah. But Mario Cristobal was evasive, as you said. I don't know what's going on there. I'm with you, though. I'm I'm on Clemson. I think in hindsight, the whole thesis around Miami has been, well, they've got pretty good defense. They've got, they should be good along the lines. They've got a good quarterback. Seems like they're starting to get some organization on offense. And oh, by the way, they beat Texas A&M. We thought a lot more highly of that win back in week two than I think we do now. So uh, different circumstance for A&M back then, but I'm on Clemson here. I'm on Clemson because I don't think Miami is as impressive as we thought. And of course, the win, the 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 game last week against North Carolina did not really give me much to hang my hat on with respect to the, even the even the uh, Miami defense. So I'm going to go Clemson minus the four points on the road. Okay. Uh, I also have Duke Florida State, kind of an ACC quad. Actually, why? Florida State favored by 14 points. Riley Leonard still day to day. I think his status is critically important here. I have to believe if there is any way he can give it a go, he'll try. This is a big game. This is a really big game for Duke. I do think the defense is good enough to keep it within striking distance. And on top of that, their offense plays very slowly. They're going to shorten the game. And that makes it hard, I think, to cover a 14-point spread. So for me, I'm on, I'm on Duke plus the number. I am as well. The night element of this scares me, but I like the Duke defense. I like the fact that Duke beat North Carolina. They beat NC State last week, right? 24 to three or something like that with their backup quarterback who was yeah. like four of 12 through the air. And so that's always going to be difficult. But uh, I, I, I still like Duke to keep it relatively close because I think they can make Florida State uncomfortable. What's your third quad? Third quad is Michigan, Michigan State. Oh, God bless. Yeah. yeah. So here, here's an interesting stat. Michigan has not played a team inside the SP plus top 50 all season. Technically, the best team they played was Rutgers. Yep, I agree. They were 52nd, followed by Nebraska, who's 53rd, followed by Minnesota, who's 56th. Michigan State is 55th. So they're nothing if not consistent playing fringe top 50 SP plus teams. They won't play a top 50 SP plus team until the final three weeks of the season when they've got Penn State. Maryland and Ohio State. We have talked a lot about that on this show. Um, but let me re digress for a second. Please, the floor is yours. Way back when, way back when, when you were still childless and I was young and happy and less gray. Yeah. I used to talk often about the power of the de facto national championship. Yeah. And I think you combine that with the rivalry. What are we doing a rivalry just for the fun? Those records out. Throw them out. Combine those two occult forces. Michigan State is not making a bowl this year, Dan. Not even close. Mm -hmm. But they clearly care about this game more than I think Michigan does. 
So Michigan wins, but 24 and a half is the spread. Take the points. Michigan State at home. Take the points. <sighs> okay. Home dog of the week. Where's my sound? There it is. Why not? Oh, do you want me to tell you why not? Home dog of the week. Um, let's go. There, there may be whoever's playing quarterback for Michigan State might throw four interceptions <laughs> into this Michigan defense. Um, they're just not a team built to win. Obviously, with all the changes at the top, that doesn't matter. Help. Doesn't matter. Rivalry doesn't matter. Okay, doesn't matter. That's Fair my enough. third quad. Uh, final one is TCU at K State. Okay. Yep, they're one of my quads. Because you and I are nothing if not Hoover approvers. <laughs> yep. Do you like that construction? I just not came bad. up with it. It's not bad. I like him. I watched all of the game last week. He's got a bit of like a three-quarter delivery. They posted up BYU last week. I mean that literally all they ran were posts in the passing game. Yeah. That is all they did. They were all open with the exception of like one or two of them. I don't think they'll have that level of success against K-State. However, I'm into the story and I've always loved TCU. So I'm not picking them outright, but I'm picking them plus seven and a half. That's my final quad. My third quad is Ole Miss Auburn because I think the chaos potential is pretty mm. high. Uh, I wish Auburn's defense were a little bit better. I would have loved to uh, to take an Auburn, but I like Ole Miss here. I'm going to give the points on the road. It scares me, but I'm going to do it anyway just because I think they have more ways to win. Defense is better than I thought it would be. And while Jackson Dart has been inconsistent this year, I think, again, there are multiple ways in which this offense can perform. Um, not taking Michigan, Michigan State, although I'm giving, I mean, in my quad, I'm giving the points there for Michigan. Uh, I'm giving the points Texas Tech against BYU. Uh, TCU, Kansas State is my uh, my fourth one. I'm taking TCU there. I don't love it. I just think it's going to be a fun back and forth. I think both of these teams are still pretty flawed. But yeah. I like the TCU's defense in this spot against the Kansas State offense that has yet to figure things out. Weird that the offensive line has been an issue this year. That's just strange to talk about with K-State. So that's my quad. Clemson, Duke, Ole Miss. TCU all road teams is where I'm yeah. thinking in that game a super eight Saturday a Samsonite Saturday for me um otherwise yeah I'm taking Texas Tech I hate it but I hate BYU's defense and Keaton Slovis in an interesting winnable game uh even more so I'm going Texas Tech there LSU big against a bad army defense North Carolina big against Virginia at home in Chapel Hill went back and forth on this one wanted to take Darren Granger and Georgia State but the game is at Louisiana I'm going to give those points there I think they're more complete yeah, and just to be complete here, there are two Pac-12 after dark games. There's UCLA minus 17 on the road at Stanford. There's Arizona State at Washington. Um, is there a hangover effect in play for Washington? I have both dogs here. I think, yeah. look, I am not positive that there will be a hangover effect for Washington. But if there ever were a case to be made that a team would be hung over and have a letdown moment. It would be the manner in which they beat their biggest rival or their most important rival, given where Wazoo is right now, and that they're both joining the Big Ten together uh, with game day there on network TV, like with a presumed Heisman favorite. ASU can do enough in the pass rush to me that they could limit it a little bit. They beat Washington last year. It's actually a revenge spot for the Huskies okay. in the All desert. Right. Um, and it was kind of a catastrophic year for ASU last year. And that pass rush did get to Michael Penix last year. I think you're going to see a little bit of that. So I'm taking the points there, not because I feel like ASU is terrific as they're down to their third string quarterback, but because I think they can get off the field a little bit and limit those opportunities. I also have Stanford covering at home in a letdown spot of their own after that 29, nothing Friday night cover, but UCLA and that number 16 and a half with a turnover prone offense right now. You saw Colin Schley getting in there last week and, you know, packages for, for the Bruins because the full trust in Dante Moore doesn't seem to be there yet or as much as they would have hoped early on. So I'm going Stanford at home to make this interesting. All right. Those are all of your games for this week. All of no, them. I fully disagree with that uh, because my request for you is to drop that big, stanky, tantalizing, insatiable drum and fife we got three pat lee games this week only three they're three biggies lehigh on the road at <laughs> bucknell dan uh, yeah this is a second act saturday for the engineers lehigh bucknell i'm gonna go lehigh on the road how about that no, i go i'm gonna go nelly's it breaks me uh this is a big one actually this is sort of for supremacy of the patriot league 
It is. Lafayette at five and one at Holy Cross, four and two. Who you got? They're airing this across all of the networks like they do for like huge breaking news, right. election coverage, something like that. So it's going to be a CBS, NBC, ABC matchup uh, with those bright lights. I'm going Lafayette on the road. I think they're a team of destiny against Holy Cross. Cross Saders have been there before. Give me Cross Saders. Finally, 3 p.m. ESPN Plus, Colgate at 2 and 4 on the road at Multisport Field. Must we even humor with a pick when Georgetown's at home at Multisport Field? No. Georgetown big. Georgetown big. I think I agree. So I tease this at the top of the show. I have some fantasy things for you guys. Oh, floor is yours. So the first one is like, I don't know. It feels like this is a gimme, but I'm going to have to say it anyway. The fact that Drew Aller was Mr. Football in the state of Ohio in 2021. Oh, yeah. And he's now playing for Penn State. I can't even like the odds of Gus Johnson bringing this up are about 100 percent. Gus, when Gus is prepping for a game, he is like a heat seeking missile trying to find anybody who was Mr. Ohio <laughs> in their respective state. Yeah, you will hear you will hear that Drew Aller, by the way, playing for Penn State, but was Mr. Ohio in the great state of Ohio, or Mr. Football in the state of Ohio back in 2021. Guaranteed. A big okay. pass from the Ohio kid. Ha ha. There is another possibility, though, that yeah. I am more excited about. And this is the one I was teasing earlier. Yeah. I am begging you, if you are out there listening to this show, at me across all platforms when this one hits, because yeah. this is the most I've ever stuck my neck out for a yeah. very specific thing that I believe has a chance of happening. Yeah. Much the way Drew Aller is from the state of Ohio now playing for Pennsylvania. Both Kyle McCord and Marvin Harrison pulled a reverse Aller. Yeah. And they went to Ohio State to play their college football. But both are from Philly. Both are from the same high school, St. Joe's Prep. Assuming there will be at least one big pass play from McCord to Harrison. Bear in mind, this is Gus freaking Johnson. Mm -hmm. I want to be the first to tell you that Gus Johnson in that precise moment is going to call that the Philly special. Whoa, that's so specifically correct. Ty. He is going to call that the Philly special. It is on a silver platter for Gus Johnson. The Philly special. I Googled it. Nobody's done it. Has he... But he's called a well, I guess they hasn't they haven't played a team for Pennsylvania, but he's called Ohio State games this year, right? I think they did the Maryland game. I am telling you that the allure of that Pennsylvania Ohio State conflict. Here, yeah. Philly special. All right. Take it to the bank. Man. I think I I don't have a, a fantasy thing as good as that, but I think if the USC game is going poorly, the pivot to Caleb Williams draft talk is going to be so <laughs> precise and surgical yeah. that be like, look, sure, USC is disappointing this year. You, you think it's going to translate to the next level? You think it's going to? I think that the, that is going to be like a back half of the season if things continue to go poorly for USC. It's Caleb Williams, the presumed number one pick. And then the concept of Caleb Williams maybe is going to stay at USC so he can hand pick who he's going to play for did you NFL. did you happen to see the rumors that are out there that caleb williams may request ownership partial ownership in the team that picks him yeah that's great that's shooting for the moon i think aaron Rodgers requested that from the jets and didn't get it didn't get it didn't get it caleb look listen all negotiations have a starting point ty yeah does and he really want to own the bears though ty the the nfl is <laughs> bad team proof in terms of how profitable they can be people show up to bears games enthusiastically and willingly every week yeah so yes all right let's close this thing out shall we Ty versus the world Steve le monde el mundo Ty versus the world presented by DraftKings sportsbook so i need your help in naming this we we did not name this yeah i threw out a name you hated it mhm mm I didn't understand it, so that's you why. didn't understand it. That's fine. Yeah. That's that's what I'm good at. So the the game is Minnesota at Iowa. Everybody is dunking on this game because they're over under is 32 and a half points. I believe they'll hit that under. I don't think anybody's scoring in this game, just like last year. So yeah. this pick 
is a combination of the under 32 and a half total. Also, the under 16 and a half first half total combined with Iowa winning specifically by a one to six point margin. Okay. Three very specific things about seven to one odds. Now, this is the Floyd of Rosedale game. I posited to you, should we call this the void of points Dale parlay? You didn't like that. No, I was trying to figure out what the connection was to college football. And I was thinking of what's like the Archie and Jughead show Riverdale. That's where I thought it was. No, 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 no. Didn't have it. So what do we call this then? If you don't like that, if you don't get it, fine. But we need a better name for it. I'm putting you on the spot, but this is what you're good at. It's the punt bowl parlay. The punt bowl parlay. That's beautiful. Because you got to hit those unders. You need, I mean, Tory Taylor's incredible. He's one of the best players at college football. Punting is winning parlay. That's too many letters to me. The punt bowl parlay is beautiful. The punt bowl parlay. Okay. Punt bowl parlay, again, under 32 and a half. The under 16 and a half first half line. And then Iowa to win specifically by one to six points. As for other games here that I will just throw out there, I do like Oregon big. I okay. like Oregon minus whatever in that matchup against um, Washington State. Yep. Uh, the other game that I will throw in there, you know, just because we're going to keep things interesting, um, I will throw, let's see, let's go Oklahoma minus the number against UCF. I think they win that one handily. And let's also, just to be complete, throw in Oklahoma State again, plus the three and a half points on the road at West Virginia. So again, we're going Oregon, we're going Oklahoma, and we're going Oklahoma State. Three O's and the punt bowl parlay, Dan. That are, those are my picks for this year, week eight. As you know, football, more fun when you are in on the action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Sign up with code SOLID. New customers can bet $5 to get 200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of the NFL. Use the code SOLID. Dan Rubenstein, the crown as ever is yours. All right. That's what we got. That's what we got. I didn't give a lock, did I? Neither of us did. Do you have a lock? Any of those um, games? I mean, we're just, what's here? Lock of the week. I'm really going to test this out. Let's lock up Alabama minus nine. See what happens. All right, I'm going Michigan minus whatever. Oh, you're going against me. Look at you. Yeah. Okay. That's all. Fair enough. Wherever you may be, make sure you subscribe, follow, like, rate, and review the podcast. It helps. Check us out at verballers.com. Get in on Run the Board Week 8 for that $100 gift card to not a sponsor. Could be Nike.com. For that, go over there, my good friend, Dan Rubenstein. For myself, Ty Hildebrandt. Hope to hear from you all on the Reverb line at 855-VERBAL-3. As always, stay solid. Peace. Gambling, Gambling problem? Law. Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY at 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario, see dkng.co slash football for eligibility terms and responsible gaming resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility.